Okay, let me start with this uh, important topic known as public interest litigation. Well, in Kenya, this is the component of litigation that is developing very fast. This is uh, the area in which uh, the lawyer is addressing such issues as common good or the public good. So when we say something is of the public good or something is of the common good, it is of the general good. It is uh, for us to be more conscious and more aware of what is happening in our neighborhood, in our country, uh, whether it is uh, in the political sector or in economic sector, financial sector, or in ethical sector or social sector or legal sector, they are all matters of public interest, including the environment and uh, ecological issues, climate change, and all those other things are put together as public interest litigations. My answer to this, according to my reading, every citizen is a custodian of the constitution of the Republic of Kenya. I will explain this uh, in a while. Um, the main arm of government, according to the constitution that is given high authority over the custody of the constitution is the judiciary. That is the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal, and the High Court and other subordinate courts. So in this hierarchy, we find that the judiciary is holding an upper hand in the protection and the safeguard of the, the highest book of law in the land. That is the constitution and safeguarding the supremacy of the constitution and the constitutionalism in the Republic of Kenya. My wonder is, and my guess would be equally as good as yours, that there is no such word in the constitution in the Republic of Kenya as the negotiated democracy. Well, when we talk of negotiation, we should remove democracy because the two concepts are not telling together. Let us uh, agree to disagree that when democracy is taken in its what I call its virgin uh, nature, it means demos, meaning the people, kratia, meaning rule. So the rule of the people, by the people, and of the people. So democracy, as uh, stated within our constitution, is promoting democracy. And democracy here means participation of demos, participation of the people. People must participate in any democratic process, especially in the electoral process. And in that case, the constitution is indeed very clear when it comes to creating certain significant institutions, eh, whether political institutions or legal institutions or rather financial institutions, or any other institutions such as social institutions or the environment as we referred to much earlier. But when we say negotiated, this word or the wording is coming from one part of Kenya, northeastern part of Kenya. And the communities there believe in the negotiation within community members in order to come up with who is to be the leader. However, still, does this one fit in well with the democracy as we know it? Does it fit in well with the electoral procedures and processes? Does it fit in well with our new Kenya and the new constitution? The answer to this, I'm afraid, is on the negative because what would be on the positive is uh, democracy. Democracy is what we have on the table. Uh, 
than the constitutionalism. Do people elect their leaders or they nominate their leaders? Do people elect their leaders or they appoint their leaders? These are the questions you should put to yourselves when we talk about negotiated democracy in the Republic of Kenya as things stand today. Um, Yusuf Haji, Haji died and uh, he was a veteran politician, uh, a personality in the Kenyan politics, a game changer, and one who saw Kenya through a lot of conflicts, especially pitting Somalia and the Republic of Kenya for so long uh, during the time of former President Moy, and also during this time of uh, President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, but also the former president, uh, Mwai Kibaki. So Haji died, and what is coming up is that members of his community, uh, don't ask me who are the members, because that would be a concern of research, uh, agreed through a process that involves uh, consensus uh, to nominate his son, Abdul Qadir, Abdul Qadir Haji, to replace him in his capacity as the senator of the county of Garissa. I know all of you, or each one of you, you are conversant with this kind of uh, unfolding reality in the constitutional history of the Republic of Kenya. And uh, this is simply to tell you that there is still uh, so much to be done, and not only to be the custodians of the constitution, but also to be aware that uh, certain realities may emerge that may take all of us by surprise. Let us uh, look yeah, le let us look at this issue um, dealing with the some nitty gritty, just for us to engage our thoughts with public interest litigation, um, explaining to each one of us in this kind of uh, understanding of public litigation that um, when people talk about the negotiated democracy, and referring to their community, referring to their customs, traditions, practices, and also beliefs, then uh, we are talking of, uh, let us say, a group uh, practice. So that group practice has not been accommodated in the constitution of Kenya to use it as an instrument in appointing who is to be the senator and who is not to be the senator. The reason being Senate is part and parcel of the national parliament. <clears throat> Our national parliament is divided into two houses. That is the Senate itself and the National Assembly. The Senate is supposed to be in charge of the 47 counties and deal with the disputes and uh, work in the interest of the counties where the senators come from. Um, the National Assembly is composed of members of parliament that represent their constituencies and in their capacity as representatives of the people that they represent, they speak on behalf of those people. That means both houses form national parliament. National parliament is in the interest of the public insofar as it affects the public in its decisions and also in its legislative activities, oversight, but also representation. The case of uh, Honorable Yusuf Haji, who died, and the case of his son now succeeding him 
through this process uh, known hereby as negotiated democracy is becoming a contentious issue and don't be surprised if a Kenyan, any Kenyan, can move to court to seek petition or on petition to seek interpretation of the word negotiated democracy. But in this picture and having this in mind, my question is the constitutionality of negotiated democracy. Because the reason why I'm asking myself about the constitutionality is simply because some, such a thing like negotiated democracy is not within our constitutional lexicon. We have constitutional democracy and the constitution of the Republic of Kenya is supreme under Article 2 of the Constitution. I invite you to read it. Any authority or any law in the Republic of Kenya, including the customary law that is not consistent with this constitution is considered void. But to my surprise last week on 6th, um, the IEBC declared, not, not that uh, it was declared through the reading of elections, but declared Mr. Abdul Qadir or Abdul Haji the new senator of Garissa because he went unopposed. The question of being unopposed is creating another limbo. If it can translate into the denial of the constitutional rights of the Garissa citizens in electing their leader and doing it in a democratic process, then this kind of process can stand to be unconstitutional insofar as it is not within the constitution as it is called, as it is presented that people or a group of people or maybe elders or community leaders in a local place can negotiate who is to be the successor. Can we refer to that as elections or nomination? We can only refer to that action as nomination. So the, that is the successor of uh, the late senator has been nominated to fill in the vacancy. Let us again revisit the process. What happens if a member of the Senate that is a senator um, passes away or maybe is incapacitated what are the processes and procedures according to the constitution the process is first the speaker of the house that is of the senate must advertise after declaring vacant that position because that position is known as elective position, not nominative position, but elective position. That means you must be elected in order to fill that position. Let us go deeper into the meaning of elected. Elected means that you have gone through the democratic process of being elected. Some people must go the electorates must go to the ballot, that is the box, on a designated day, the designated time, with the designated documents for elections, and elect you as their senator. If that process is not done, in the event that it is not done, and in disregard of the environment around, um, the community within courts decides that we have decided that the son of the late senator is the one 
filling the vacancy or the vacant position, then that is a new initiative in the constitution of Kenya. It is like rewriting the constitution. I am not surprised that many lawyers today are asking themselves the very question, was this done within the spirit and letter of the constitution? Where in the constitution do we find negotiated democracy? If this is the case, then by elections in the Republic of Kenya could as well be carried out using negotiations using such kind of uh, uh, processes that are not elections. Because election, in my understanding, means you have right to vote a leader or a candidate of your choice. And you do it in secret. We have secret ballots and not public. So these are all principles within our constitution. So the principles and values of the constitution under Article 10 do not capture the negotiated democracy. This is a new creature. And a new creature being extended to the national level. If it was just simply at the county level, that is a matter of Garissa, and that is under the county assembly, then it would again be studied in terms of its constitutionality, but affecting only the citizens or the residents of Garissa. But if it is extended to the national Senate, that is affecting all of us, it becomes public interest litigation issue that will attract any person to file a petition to petition the honorable court the honorable judges on the ground of interpretation of negotiated democracy in this case the petitioner versus uh, an enjoinder or a group of respondents and the first respondent in this case must be iebc that is charged with any activity concerning democratic elections and it must be done independently not being coerced by any community or any powerful authority or any political elite number two as respondent in this line of hierarchy must be the office of the attorney general the attorney general must also respond to questions pertaining to the constitutionality of that process. In this regard, number three should be the party, political party of the candidate that has also something to respond to when it comes to the electoral processes and democratic processes in the Republic of Kenya in conformity with the constitution. But also we should not allow any possibility that such things can happen without the vigilance of the law society of Kenya. So LSK is another respondent in this kind of litigation. What am I talking about? I'm talking about an issue that has happened. The declaration has been done. And to your surprise, and also to my surprise as well, it will not go unchallenged in the courts of law so that Kenyans must get to know the truth, whether negotiated democracy is part and parcel of the laws of the Republic of Kenya, or it is recognized in the Republic of Kenya. It is going to set up a wrong precedent, especially for the IEBC. It is going to set up a wrong precedence for the judiciary, a wrong precedence also for the legislature, of course, where all these kinds of negotiations happen to occur. 
another argument would be that the um, alternative dispute resolution mechanisms also recognize mediation, arbitration, conciliation, but also traditional dispute resolution mechanisms. But remember that even despite this, under uh, the Article 159 of the Constitution, sub-Article 3, any kind of system that is considered alternative must be in conformity with the Constitution, with the written laws of Kenya, but must also not be seen to be repugnant or against justice and morality. So having all this in mind, my dear uh, students, it is a question of interrogating our knowledge when it comes to the constitutionality of any decision made by any leadership in the Republic of Kenya. Because if this one goes unchallenged, then it becomes president, then one day certain communities may decide to split off from Kenya, and they are not part of the Republic of Kenya. Who will stop them? So such negotiations must again be seen in the light of the constitution. That's what we mean, the constitutionality of an action or rather of a process. And it is upon the judiciary to provide us with the correct, accurate, acceptable, and legitimate interpretation of the constitution when it comes to negotiated democracy. So in this case, we find that law, as we studied, is a speculative sense. It speculates around some behavior within the society, how individuals and groups or communities behave at any given time and how such behavior can affect all of us or can affect the entire public. I, I would like to I have a contribution to what the same, the same issue of uh, the recently uh, elected, not really elected, now <laughs> appointed, I would say, Senator of um, Garissa. I agree with you first in terms of um, uh, the target of negotiated democracy, because even in negotiated democracy, it, 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 it's, uh, it's absurd even to put negotiation on it. I mean, to put uh, democracy on a negotiation, the, the, the two words, they don't even match. There's a mismatch. Exactly. So, um, so um, yeah, in terms of, uh, it wouldn't have been a, 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 a democracy because once they go negotiate, who are these people who negotiate? Definitely they're normally the elders in the, in, in the Somali, as, as part of the Somali culture. And in the elders, in their negotiation, it's discriminatory for it to bring about a national leader because it's only elders, there are no, there are no women, I mean, um, the youth have been left out, you see? So even during their, 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 um, their negotiation, there is, a, there is the aspect of discrimination. It's not all inclusive. Second, um, but when it comes to the election, the, 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 the appoint, the, um, I don't know whether now to put it an appointment or, ele or an election or election of uh, the Garita Senator. You'll find that where ICBC will find um, uh, uh, the argument is this was the only candidate who presented his nomination papers. So no other candidates presented their nomination papers from either party presented their nomination papers by the de by the deadline. So he was the only candidate. And then and then it is, it's when the IEBC gazetted and they declared no contest. Being that they, they wouldn't hold a contest against one person. Abdul, uh, Abdul Qadir would not run against himself. So they went ahead and declared him um, uh, the senator, 
So here, I think IEBC will find a way to, uh, to protect themselves, or they will argue out they did not actually listen to them or uh, take the negotiated democracy being claimed by the elders. Rather, with them, they looked at it as just the normal procedure of election. And then they went for the election, they, they uh, announced someone to people to bring in their nomination papers, there was no one, with, there was only one person, and then they declared. So they may not really be thinking that, hey, we actually look at the negotiated democracy aspect. Thank you. Good. Thanks so much for taking us through this kind of elaboration. That is very good. Um, my question still is, because how do you call something election, which is not election? Because this is independent electoral and boundary commission. And in this case, I would say this, if only one candidate did present his papers, as uh, the interested party. And uh, we did quote on the background, we are aware of negotiation. Negotiation can as well uh, threaten other people not to show up. Who, who is there to tell us? So what IBC should have done, and I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to give uh, an easy way for the IBC to pass through in the sense that you generate another ballot paper with only one candidate and put yes or no and allow people to queue up and uh, put their marks just the way we do at the referendum and in that case it will show that out of uh, let us say 3000 voters that presented themselves at least some two said no the majority said yes. So this is still uh, a scapegoat. And I would argue it, it can be meant for maintaining peace within the community, but should not be used as an electoral tool. When we are looking at the, the Garissa scenario, where, where do we now raise a constitutional question? Because for me, and this is my thinking that the, the, the IMBC was not interested and should not be interested on how the the the, the or what, what was done to come up with the candidate. Because can other people come from uh, and, and it has been uh, the grand vacant, you cannot tell. The discussion that they have there in their boardrooms or whatever they are meeting, that one is not a concern to the IBC. The the, the concern of the IBC is to start with it doing the nominations. So we need to ask ourselves, did the IBC carry out its mandate, its constitutional mandate? Did it call for the nominations of candidates when the candidate was presented their papers? Yes. Only one candidate did presented his papers. Excuse me, Muturi. Excuse me, Muturi. Yeah. The yes. IEBC has got no mandate to nominate. It has the mandate to carry out electoral process elections so let us try to isolate the word nomination when we are talking about iebc independent electoral and boundary commission that is the that is the commission we know and that's the, in the constitution so where is the elections when you where, muturi look at it this way this is just common sense when you say you elect what does it mean to you and when you say you nominate, you can nominate anybody. You can nominate uh, just by the raise of hands. Uh, then you say you pick anybody that you like, but that is not election. So these are elective positions. These are not appointed positions. The president can appoint certain persons to certain offices within his powers in the constitution including the cabinet secretaries but election is distinct from nomination and i wonder i stand to be corrected if the iebc has got also the power to nominate that much i beg to differ hello, hello sir yes Excuse me, sir. yeah please um 
I would like to answer Muturi on the question of constitutionality. Um, I think that uh, the provisions of the constitution regarding free and fair elections are intended to ensure that uh, we don't revert back to the old dictatorial days. This type of tendencies of uh, nominating individuals based on what elders have decided, uh, number one, it's all based on a bias because the individual has been selected because of his relationship with the father. So this is straight out of a dictator's playbook and it is very, it is a bad precedent set for our country because uh, it can bring us back to the old days of dictatorship in which uh, democracy and the constitution take into place in order to protect. I, I, I also would like to make a contribution. I have, so, uh, I, I have heard what my colleagues have said, that is uh, with respect to the constitution. Now, the, 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 uh, and, uh, there's a very important thing that we need to note here. One is uh, every time there is a legal argument in courts, there is the issue of the intention of the law. And it is very important, especially when you listen to uh, proceedings in the American courts, they talk about what was the intention of the founding fathers. Now, we also talk about what was the intention of the committee of experts in the constitution of 2010. So, the intention of, what, was the, what is the intention of a by-election? And when you say that there shall, there shall be an election, what does it mean? It is not, it, it is not, uh, it, it is not a luxury of the IBC to, 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 to decide that uh, uh, what, what is election to them and what is not an election to them. And another important thing that we must not be blind to is that we all know what happened. And there's a reason why petitioners are taken to court. And there's a reason why uh, there's this saying that courts don't exist in a vacuum. We know what happened, and that is why there is the issue of negotiated democracy. Some people somewhere sat and thought it fit that they were important enough to decide for the entire population of Garissa how and who should be the next senator. Now, whether there's somebody who raised a question in public or in private in Garissa uh, is neither here nor there. And saying that IBC should turn a blind eye and only uh, focus on the strict word of the law is betraying the very same law and constitution that this, the, the quote-unquote elected uh, senator will be sworn under. So, so the, 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 there is a lot of betrayal, there are a lot of gray areas, and just like you said, we are trying to understand what public interest litigation in Kenya is all about. Uh, uh, I, whatever it is my colleague, especially Cosmas, is trying to say, with, with a lot of respect, that the IBC should turn a blind eye. That, that, that cannot be allowed. And if you listen carefully to the wording of the Supreme Court in the nullification of the election of 2017, they said that the, the, the election is not just an event. What were they trying to say? They were trying to say that, okay, there is very high chance that Uru Kenyatta defeated Raila Odinga, if they look at the numbers. But what was the process? What was the process? The process was not right. The reality is, what is the process that led to the IBC having one candidate by the day of the election, the process was flawed. Whether everyone in Garissa accepts it or not, it was flawed. Thank you, sir.